Welcome to the One Million Years of Joy podcast. I'm Dr. Andrea Benacar, your host, and my intention is to inspire you to find more joy in your life through the stories from our guests and the science on joy and purpose. I'm delighted to introduce to you Christoph Langwaller, who's an Austrian entrepreneur and investor. He is a CEO and co-founder of What If Foods and the Nutritional Paradox. Christoph is also the co-founder of Mega Savory Technology and Amadeus Holdings PTE, and he currently lives in Singapore. So Chris, welcome. I'm so happy to be with you here today. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I look forward to this and let's see what sort of conversation we can develop. Of course. So Chris, maybe let's begin with a deeper dive into your background and the wonderful work that you're doing at What If and everything that connects basically the concept of regeneration. Can you share more about what inspired you to have such a positive impact on this world and tell us more about the ventures that you're involved in? Well, big question. How much time have I got? <laughs> <laughs> On the less choking side, well, I grew up essentially in a village setting in Austria, just about 20 kilometers north of Salzburg. And uh, I've experienced my grandfather as a huge connector in the community. My grandfather was not only from his stature and from his build, a big man, but he was also looked up to by so many in the community as one that really had this opportunity and this gift to connect people. Because the business that my family did essentially was a business that deeply embedded within the community. And hence, my grandfather was one that really looked out for his friends and vice versa. You know, a, a pat on the back was a, a human touch uh, that always occurred. So I grew up in such a setting. I also grew up in a business that essentially was regenerative by default because, and I think this is missing in today's world, because when my grandfather spoke to his grandchildren, I'm the oldest one, so I remember him vividly. He was always emphasizing on what we call the generation contract, generational agreement, which talks about that we as humans who take over assets from our ancestors have a responsibility to leave this place a much better world than we founded and inherited from our ancestors. And that generation contract in today's business jargon or even civil society is not talking about it anymore. And hence, we have basically developed ourselves into a humanity that is happily degrading its way along without regarding anything that is left behind them. And I'm just absolutely hopeful that the new generation looks at that totally different again and probably has an ability to reflect on what I've just discussed and say, you know, there doesn't have to be a degradation throughout our life. There can be a regeneration uh, throughout our life if we just adopt business practices, but also practices in our homes that start from a different starting point. And I think that influenced really my mental fabric, my business intellect, and the way I would like to see myself leaving this planet at some stage in future. Uh, and hence, I've built an organization that today is What If Foods probably tries to honor this generation contract uh, that I was speaking about. So beautiful. So tell us more concretely about what that translates into. As an organization, we have started to really look into the definition of regeneration overall, because today you have scholars out there that talk about regeneration in terms of a regenerative economy, like John Fullerton does. Or Wolan starts with John Elkington talks about regeneration in a different spirit. And then you have regenerative farming activities who look basically on that side of things in more depth. And then you have Laura Storm, for example, who looks at regenerative leaders and what sort of fabric they are made of. And I was particularly keen to kind of weave them together in order to understand that regeneration is a system and not just actions that you take. It's a system that one has to live up to, particularly as a leader and a manager in the organization. So fundamentally, what we have tried to do is really try to reflect as leaders to basically say, so regeneration for us is nothing but our strive to share our lust for life with all those who would like to regenerate for today's youth and future generations. So that is essentially the purpose underneath which the entire fabric of the organization has been woven. And then we broke it down and say, so what does that really mean in action? 
how can you then derive a mission from there? How can you derive a goal from there? And we actually started to dig deeper into that sort of definition. And we came up with three pillars of regenerative activities. And one is basically to reconnect to communities on both ends of the spectrum, consumers as well as uh, farming communities. So those who actually work hard and labor out there on the fields in order to grow the food that the consumers at the other end of the supply chain then ultimately consume. So reconnecting, and I can speak to what we really mean and how we do it and what the essence of it is and why it is so important. So reconnection is one pillar. The second pillar is uh, restoring, in particular, degraded arable lands. And I can, again, uh, spend time on why this is so important. The restoration of degraded arable land in today's day and age is massively important, not only because of climate change, but also because of this farming communities can't pass up land and move somewhere where climate change has less impact. They need to make things work where they are. And some of them are under desperate conditions in the meantime, because soil degradation has already happened. Climate change is hitting them hard and therefore they are left without productive assets at the other end. So that is pillar number two is restoring this degraded arable land and have a positive impact on soil health in particular. And the third one is to approach food science and food technology totally different by redesigning the foods that we consume on a day-to-day -day basis in a much more replenishing fashion rather than for our own pleasure. Taste is everything for us consumers, but taste doesn't have to come at a cost of nutrition. And I'm always gutted by the distinction between there is food and then there is nutrition and there is agriculture. In reality, they are so closely interconnected with each other that one cannot be without the other. And hence, why are we having a nutritionist if we have food? So the reverse of that is that we are manufacturing food today that it is not nutritious. And that's absolutely wrong. And that is our third pillar, which is essentially looking at uh, designing food that replenishes the nutrients that we need on a day-to-day -day basis. And hence, work a lot with the concept of complete crops and complete food and strive for a diverse diet, because I don't believe that there's a superfood, there's a super diet, which is one that is rich in diversity. And hence, these are the three pillars with regards to regeneration. And that has really been the journey over the last several years to really think through as to what how lust for life can be translated through a business DNA in the way we are regenerating generating for today's youth and tomorrow's and future generations, as well as then breaking it down into the three pillars. And that is one of restoring the particular soil health, one that reconnects to farming com communities in particular, as well as then uh, start to design foods that are replenishing the nutrients we need on a day-to-day -day basis. And hence, this is some sort of the bridge. This is the arc underneath which um, the leaders, my colleagues, are making decisions. And that's a fantastic journey. That's wonderful and joyful, I would say. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I admire that you do and what you've said. And I absolutely love this concept of lust for life and how we can actually bring joy through a more conscious action and leadership. And I was curious to get your view on how do we educate the younger generations or even leaders that are more traditional, let's just say, in the way they look at prioritizing certain metrics that could be detrimental for sustainability, for regeneration, and so on. How can we change those mindsets of the younger generation or the existing leaders in a more positive way to create a better future and a brighter future for all of us? Well, I guess there are tactical approaches that one can undertake and you can go out and design for change and do all sorts of uh, psychological tricks with humanity that actually help these folks along a different path. But I guess I'll, I'll stay a little bit more grounded in a way in my answer, because I believe you have to be the change that you want to see in that world to come about. And this is just a phrase that I'm quoting Gandhi, essentially, a one that has been marching that all his life. And if you breach in business, in your marketing material, that a plant-based diet is one that helps us mitigate the results of climate change, then you should adopt it. You should live up to it. You should be doing it. Otherwise, it becomes a marketing floskel that is empty. So I think that to the essence, to the core of your question, how can you educate people? And I think educating them is, I think the simplest one is just who you would like to would like to be and who would like to see in this world around and, and, and just live, it, live up to what you are saying. Walk your talk. Yeah, and just do it. Do it and others will follow, for sure. Yes, because you become an inspiration. I hope so. 
<laughs> but that is left to others. <laughs> I don't think you can aspire to become an inspiration. That is left to others. Whether or not your path, whether or not my path is inspiring others to follow and take that step in a sem similar direction. I hope I do, but it's left to others to make a judgment on that. I think the only thing that you really can focus on is that be convinced about what you say and what you do and live up to it. Show the world that you can do it. And if you can do it, others will do as well. As simple as that. So when I look at everything that you have done for What If Foods and the positive change that you're bringing about, Tell me about your perspective on finding joy in life. Is there a connection between, as you said, what you're doing in your professional life and in your personal life? Where do the two connect and what brings you the most joy in your life? That is a big question, right? I consider myself being one of the few privileged folks out there who have this opportunity to be able to create a business, a business model, redefine it, shape it. Uh, work together with other leaders in the organization in order to refine it, that then in the essence is a vehicle to live up to what we discussed a little bit earlier, and that is to walk the talk and be the change you want to see in this world to happen. And therefore, for somebody like uh, myself and even my family, particularly my wife, who is deep in our company embedded as well, it is not any more distinction as to where are the boundaries between your personal life and your, your company life, right? It sounds horrible probably for those who don't really enjoy what they're doing at work. But for us, particularly for me, it is just the opposite. You know, the, the moment you can work on a day-to-day -day basis on regenerative practices, you see the impact uh, the business makes on farming communities in West Africa. You look at the happiness on Times Square in New York that just unleashed uh, last weekend through our market activation activities. It just gives you tremendous energy and motivation enough to keep on going and keep on digging deeper in that rabbit hole of creating this regenerative company. And therefore, the last for life I spoke about in our purpose before is one that translates itself into essentially that joy that you speak about. And for me, there's no distinction anymore between uh, what is company and what is home and so on and so forth. So it becomes all essentially one happy place that looks at regenerating what's broken and, and doing that with under the umbrella of a regenerative economy so that we are taking care of the capital cost, we're taking care of stakeholders and, and, and shareholders. That all is important. Otherwise, you end up in a, in a, in a rabbit hole that is more of an NGO that then hasn't got the ability to make capital work for the good cause. And hence, that's, I think, uh, probably is the answer. There's a blur boundary. Of course, sometimes you have to stay away to say, oh, gosh, I was, I'm feeling exhausted or I really need a break now, uh, particularly after long traveling uh, and probably some stressful times. You need to step away and go in the jungles, or in my case, I go on a tennis court and I hit on tennis balls as much as I possibly can in order to regenerate my brain and reboot it and reset it. But apart from that, there is no distinction. And that's beautiful, actually, because then there's so much joy in every moment during the day, rather than saying, oh, I can only find joy when I'm outside of my work and right now. It seems like through everything that you do, from even the choices of the food you eat to the strategies that you bring forward, everything is just a beautiful example of the lust of life that you just talked about earlier. Well, thank you. Let me say this. We strive for that, okay? Nothing is perfect in this world. We all have flaws. Um, but yeah, the, the reflection of what we're doing brings joy. And I think that is the summary, right? So if you if you strive for regeneration, if you strive for reconnecting and restoring and, and replenishing, and if you have deeply embedded in your business DNA the last for life, and then you are able to reflect as to what has happened and what sort of outcomes uh, the organization has achieved, then there is joy. There, there are always moments uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that fill me up with, I'm actually proud of what we're doing here. And oh, gosh, I didn't know that folks are up to this now. And, you know, those sort of reflective moments are really fantastic and they help you settle down and, and they help you get grounded and find the energy that you need for the next day. So, yeah. I, I love it. And Chris, you mentioned that you live in a multitude of countries from Austria, where you were born to the UK, Russia, India, China, and now you've been living in Singapore for the last 12 years. Tell me to what extent has this broad international experience and living in those, those countries has shaped how you look at how you lead your business today and all the concepts revolving around regeneration? 
That's an interesting question. Being able to be exposed to different cultures, different geographies, living in different climatic conditions, right from very, very cold countries like in Russia to Singapore on the equator in a tropical climate, uh, gives you a totally different outlook on things. It really shapes the horizon of how you go and walk through the world and through your life. I think, in particular, if you have done that as an entrepreneur, more so than as an employee who had expat packages and and an organization is taking care of of the basic necessities for you. My family and I, we didn't have that sort of luxury uh, when we lived in India, for example, or in China, or for, for the most part here in Singapore. And that sort of helps you dig deeper into what the societal needs are in particular places. So for example, when we started the the project in India, we of course were aware where we are going to. Of course, we knew the environment we go and settle into for some time, but uh, we were not aware of how important our business strategies can become and unfold for the community uh, in that particular location. And hence at times then it is overwhelming because you have a moral obligation You build a moral obligation and a responsibility. And at times, I was probably really too young to be able to totally inhale that and probably even live up to that obligation that we walked into. So while the externalities and these different places have shaped the worldview of mine, so has the journey overall. These decades of living in different countries have shaped me because I think I was, as I said before, I was just very, very young when we moved to India. And today I look at it totally different. I look at it from totally different vintage points. I look back to India and I reflect on people like C.V. Jacob, totally different than I did when I was there. And that's fascinating. So I think that's the, the ability to reflect on so many different touch points in one's journey that is shaped by location, by climatic conditions, by cultures, by people, by all sorts of different smells and sizes and other sensory impressions that really helps you probably broaden the vision of what's possible out there rather than if you stay all your life in one place and try to maneuver the world's challenges through that. I think um, broadening the horizon through the senses is, is the one that helps you reflect more deeply. Yes, it's so enriching to experience the world in a new light. And particularly when you're living in those countries, it's so different, of course, than when you're traveling and so on. And I can see the impact it has had on the way you look at the world and so on. It's really beautiful to see. And you were talking about earlier about the moral obligation that you felt you had towards the communities that you were serving. And I'm thinking about the obligations, maybe looking forward that maybe some people may not necessarily be taking very seriously, right? The obligation when you're looking at the severity of climate change and all the different problems that we hear about in the news, looking forward, if there is one specific action that companies could take to shift the needle in a positive way, What would that shift be? And what is actually missing today? In other words, because when you're looking at the problems relating particularly to climate change, we've known about this for many, many years. But despite that, there's a resistance for some leaders to actually embrace that change. So what is missing in your view and what needs to change? I take a deep breath here because who am I to give an advice to other leaders? Um, I'm just one tiny, small wheel in a global economy that tries to to come up with a a better, better, a better, better way of doing things. And I'm in no position to give somebody else an advice. But what I'm trying to do is to lift the change I want to see in that world. And I try to live it every day, every hour of a day, and probably every minute of that hour. And if that inspires others to follow, then I'm a happy man. If not, then I hope that still my actions are bringing the positive change about that we are desperately need. I'm in no position to give other leaders an advice and come up with a recipe because there are thousands of recipes out there that people should adopt. And then there's this model and that model and so on and so forth. If you fail to have the understanding of biological systems and how interwoven everything is, and that essentially we are all one and we are deeply connected through a few atoms in our bodies that have been smelted and casted in the universe out there over billions of years. And if we start to understand that we are just one, we probably would start looking at 
key performance indicators differently. We would look at the capitalism differently. We wouldn't talk about the left and the right. We would talk about how can we move forward to lift this planet a better place than we inherited it. And if that would be the mantra and the, the mindset that people would adopt, not only companies, but gosh, leaders, policymakers, NGOs, you know, if, if we would understand that, then I'm sure we would make better decisions. We would make decisions that are based on a more on the generational contract that I was talking about when we started this conversation, rather than of just, I have to deliver this KPI right now because otherwise, you know, whatever. So I think that's really what it runs down to. What sums it up is that we need to understand that we are just so interconnected and we all want. And that is not just humanity. It's the biological systems out there. It's the ecosystem, the flora and the fauna. And it is basically that privilege that we have to live on a planet where, as Sagan said, atoms contemplate atoms. And uh, we are in such a privileged position to do that. And we never talk about it. Hardly we talk about it. In, and that's, that's actually sad that humanity hasn't reached an evolutionary level yet that has profoundly embedded that thinking throughout humanity. Just if you can do it. And uh, I would love to see us going there. Same here. <laughs> Same here, definitely. So Chris, as you think about some of the actions you've taken to date and you look back on your life, if there would be one thing that you could change, would you change anything? Well, <laughs> you got me on this one. What would I change? I made many mistakes in my life. I probably would change that I should fail faster, um, cut earlier. If things don't work, if they're not up to your own standard, do away with them, things like that. But I am not really a person that is so, so deep in, in, or I'm not really living in a, in a world that is one of the past. I am, I'm a keen lifelong learner. I think I do reflect quite deeply and frequently on what's happening around me in all sorts of things of life. And I always try to look at what is what can be done better in future and what is it that moves the needle faster towards the right direction tomorrow. So how can I be a better version tomorrow than I am today is the core mantra that I kind of utter on a frequent basis to myself. But yes, of course, I could point that, oh, I've made this mistake over here, or I didn't listen to my wife over there and she was right, or, you know, things like that I could say. But at the end of the day, they're just dragging you down and uh, they're just holding you back uh, and they're holding you back to deeply explore your own or my own lust for life. And the way I would like to translate that into a regeneration and to come up with a business that strives to be a better version tomorrow than we are today. And, and hence, reflection is good. Learning is important. But why live in the past if you have a future in front of you? So just go forward. And talking about going forward, actually, what are some of the things that you have on your bucket list or some of your aspirations that you would envision to achieve to have no regrets? My colleagues and I are creating a business that has, I think, the potential to really do good on, at scale. And I could go into telling you what it would mean if we are 1.7% of today's alternative products, so alternative milk slash alternative meat products, what would happen and what would we unfold and, and, and so on and so forth. And these are fascinating numbers. It's fascinating numbers because we would touch, for example, 20,000 hectares of restoration of soil restoration we would touch about 15 to 20,000 farmers and in communities that we are working with, one farmer is responsible for about a family containing about 10 family members. So we're talking about 180,000, 200,000 people all together. We would talk about bringing carbon into that particular degraded soils. We would talk about nitrogen fixing. We would talk about replenishing the body with uh, plant protein. We would talk about reconnect. All of that stuff are KPIs that we are striving for in, in the next sort of step for us as an organization. But if you ask me personally as to what my goal is and what I would love to achieve through all of this, it's very, very simple. At the end of my life, if there is somewhere a graveyard and a tombstone, and it says this bugger had a good go about doing the right thing, if that is engraved on it, then I'm the happiest man leaving this planet. And that's what I'm striving for. As simple as that. How beautiful. So beautiful, Chris. You see, I, I've lost my train of thought <laughs> just listening to you <laughs> now. <laughs> so I'll maybe just ask one final question. What are you most grateful for to date? And that brings you immense joy. I'm super grateful of my family. 
Without my family, I couldn't do what we're doing. Uh, without them uh, bearing this nonsense of Chris that he comes up uh, every now and then and, uh, and try to push our, uh, ourselves, I couldn't do what we're doing. So I'm super grateful for that. But I'm also grateful of the journey that we have we have walked on. Because when I grew up as a young boy in, in Salzburg, I was going into the primary school and was diagnosed with dyslexia. And I had a horrible time learning. So nothing was really clear for me as to how my professional path looks like. And I'm super grateful of having this opportunity to explore the world in the way we have done, my family and I. And then probably the biggest one of it all is essentially to be, to live in a pivotal moment in time on this planet consciously that allows us to contemplate new solutions and new beings for this youth generation as well as future generations to come. I think we are absolutely privileged to live in this moment in time where we finally have recognized that unintended consequences are those that are destroying an environment around us that makes future generations living uh, a hell on this planet, potentially. And being able to be on that planet right now in this moment is an absolute privilege. To contribute to that change is, I think, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity <laughs> It sounds a bit cheeky in that context, but I, I think you get what I want to say. It is that we, we're living in a world today where we have disruption everywhere. We have left and right, and the trenches are being dug deeper than they, they were, rather than building bridges over them. We're living in the 21st century with nonsense wars, and we are living in a world where food prices explode and communities are being left behind. We're living in a world where migration is happening, uh, climate change is making people move away from their homes. And the list goes on and on and on. One can look at that as an absolute disaster and stay away and look at that from too complex of an issue to resolve. But I don't do that. I consider it as an absolute blessing to be on this planet right now, to be able to come up with solutions in order to create a future that is one of a regeneration. I think this is what really matters. It is about that positivity. It's this Ethiopian worldview that I would like to be able to help shape rather than look at how oh, everything is lost and therefore glasses half empty. No, it is not. We have a fantastic opportunity to create something that is much more exciting, much more colorful, driven by scent and flavors, textures that we are unaware of yet. And uh, let them come about. Let us unfold it. Let us see what's behind that corner. I love that. And it's so poetic. And it <laughs> connects to what you mentioned earlier, that we need to become one. We need to really join forces to be able to tackle a lot of the problems that we currently have out there, as you mentioned. So it's been such a, an honor and pleasure to talk to you, Chris, and to discover your world and the positive contributions you're making. And at least in my eyes, and I hope in the eyes of the listeners as well, you're a true inspiration for current generations, for future generations. It's been an immense pleasure to speak with you today. Any final thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience? First of all, thank you very, very much for giving me your platform to be able to share a little bit about my thoughts and, and what we are doing. I walked into this podcast today with you without much expectation but the conversation around joy you know it opens up a box that is so different from other podcasts that i've done in the past i think this one really goes emotionally much deeper than than the others that i've done and i really really enjoy that i enjoy to be able to speak about our last for life i really enjoy making sure that people understand what last for life can actually mean in a business dna and how it can translate into regeneration and what these pillars are that we are striving to build and therefore i thank you very much and i hope Hope, uh, your listeners and viewers can take away one or two seeds that they can take away with them and plant somewhere and hopefully something beautiful sprouts from there and if that happens if we succeed in one or two seeds do that then i'm absolutely grateful and i'm looking forward probably to meet that person sometime in the future so thank you very much thank you chris it's been a great pleasure thank you